Thanks, Ken. That was a very nice introduction. I feel like there should have been like music playing, and I should have <laughs> jumped through a yeah something like that. Okay, so. Um, uh, the topic that I selected today was based on the, the fact that I think a lot of the people here are interested in you know, how it is that robots and people might interact. And one of the problems that you have to solve if you're interested in that question is how to make models of people. Uh, so you might make, want to make models of people so that you can predict what people will do in particular situations. You might want to make models of people so that you can make inferences from human behavior. So what it is that people want, what are people's goals are, what their preferences are things that require you to start with a model for how those preferences and goals and so on relate to the way in which they act that you can then use to work backwards and figure out you know, what the things were that motivated those behaviors. So you know, I've talked to some of the people in this room who've said, we need to have a model of human cognition, and we don't know what to do. Or they've read some psychology papers, and they say, OK, we're going to use this as a basis for our model. But uh, the real issue that you have when you start to think about these questions is how to reconcile the psychological literature with the kind of approach that I think is often used in the context of you know, making robots and so on, which is thinking about optimization problems. So you know, you're kind of faced with an unsatisfying choice where on the one hand you might model human behavior as being the consequence of some kind of process of rational action whereby people are choosing the things that make the most sense given their internal dispositions. And on the other hand, if you go and look at the psychological literature, at least here as manifest in a, in a lot of uh, popular science books, you uh, discover that, in fact, you know, this kind of model of rational behavior isn't really a good description of what people do. So you, know, you find that there are various arguments that what people do is more like following error-prone heuristics that depend on the particular situation that they're in and the particular problem that they're trying to solve. So the question is, what should you do? Right? If you want to make models of people, you want to make models which are going to generalize across a wide range of circumstances. Uh, one of the problems with following this kind of you know, grab bag of heuristics is that it doesn't tell you in what, a particular situation how you might expect people to act. Uh, but you also want a model of behavior which is going to be something that's going to be accurate, that's actually going to make the right predictions about what people are going to do in particular situations. So uh, my colleagues and I have been working on a way to reconcile this kind of, uh, you know, at this point, a sort of binary by thinking about a strategy which combines the strengths of these two approaches. It gives us a way of thinking about how you can de derive a, a sort of optimization-based framework for modeling human cognition, but nonetheless be able to capture the kinds of behaviors that have led people to take this more pessimistic view of how human minds work. So this framework, which uh, we've been developing uh, in collaboration in particular with Falk Leader, who is a graduate student here at Berkeley, uh, as well as a bunch of other people who I'll, I'll talk about as we go along. Noah Goodman here is uh, a professor at Stanford. So a lot of the work I'm going to talk about today is work that was done by Falk. Uh, basically says one way that we can make models of human cognition that are generalizable but nonetheless accurate is to take the principle of rationality, which we use for thinking about uh, what the right thing to do in a particular situation and push that principle one level deeper. So rather than making theories in which we just think about the actions that agents can take in the world, we make theories which think about the computational actions that agents could be performing in order to choose the actions which they're going to execute in the world. And so we take that principle of rationality from the abstract level of agents in the world and push it one level deeper to the level of the algorithms that those agents in the world choose to execute. So just to kind of do this in cartoon form, here's our standard you know, picture of how the mind works. Right? Uh, this, you, uh, this is a little outdated, actually. We now know that this is a digital camera. not This is film here. So this is like an old-fashioned model of how the mind works. But the basic idea is that information comes in here, right? And then it gets processed. And then you know, there's a bunch of scientists inside your head who are looking at that information and deciding how to take actions. Okay? So your classical sort of theory of rationality says, OK, what these people are doing is you know, they see a stimulus. They decide the best action to take. And they're doing so in a way which maximizes their expected utility. Well, what we do is we equip those scientists with a little computer, and now the actions that they can take are not just actions in the world, but also actions that are using that computer to simulate the outcomes of you know, pursuing particular courses of action. So now the choices that they're making are choices which are about the computational actions to execute, as well as the actions that they might execute in the world. So you know, one way of, uh, of sort of making that statement is to say that what we're doing is making models where we're explicitly thinking about the trade-off uh, between the errors that we make in solving problems and the cost of computation or the cost of the time that goes into solving those problems, assuming some kind of abstract underlying computational architecture which we're using as the basis for solving that problem. 
And so this kind of approach is an instance of the framework of bounded optimality that Stuart Russell has introduced in the context of thinking about AI systems. So, you know, rather than thinking about completely abstract agents without computational constraints, we think about agents that are real agents that have real computational architectures, and the task that they're performing is one of selecting the best algorithm to use to solve a problem. And so this is the you know, the connection between this and the book that Ken was telling you about. I mean, I think the implicit premise of that book is that, in some ways, computer science is a better guide to how to live than economics, right? If uh, your sort of idealized economic agent is the one who's always going to take the best action without thinking about the underlying computational cost, and really, in human lives, you're better being guided by thinking about exactly these trade-offs between the amount of computation you have to do to solve a problem and how good the solution ends up being. So, uh, again, you know, we can sort of draw a little cartoon picture of this. Uh, if you kind of think about, here's the space of strategies that we can follow, then uh, performance is improving as we move sort of further up through this space. Uh, the idea of optimal behavior then corresponds to doing the very best thing that we could, the thing that ends up producing the, the best possible performance. And then one thing that people talk about when they talk about human behavior and they talk about the limitations of this kind of approach is the idea of bounded rationality. So when people uh, do studies where they show that the actions that people take deviate from rational behavior, what they, the way that they explain this is normally in terms of saying, okay, well, what we're looking at here is bounded rationality. This is a consequence of you know, people being unable to actually execute these optimal solutions. But bounded rationality, the idea that there are some constraints on the operations that we can perform, just sort of picks out a part of this space which we, we know that we have to occupy. And bounded optimality corresponds to the point in this space which is the best point that we can achieve given the computational resources that we have available to us. So when we think about this in the context of this debate about human rationality, what this does is set us up with a new kind of question that we can ask about human cognition. So we know that we're not optimal. There are plenty of behavioral results that tell us that we're not at the sort of peak of the pyramid here. But we can ask the question of whether we're actually bounded optimal for some reasonable assumptions that we could make about the sorts of computational architectures that we have. We could use this principle of bounded optimality as a guide to making generalizable models of human cognition that you can then use in applications that you're interested in, in having those models for. So, uh, you know, the question then is, if we're somewhere in this space, how close are we to, to these strategies that end up being good strategies for solving problems? And do the results that we've, we've found about, you know, how people actually act when they're doing things like making decisions tell us that we're really fundamentally irrational or instead tell us that we're pretty good at solving what turn out to be pretty complex kinds of problems? So we've pursued this kind of question in the context of... Uh, some of the, the classic sorts of tasks that have been used to argue against human rationality. So, uh, and the results that we get fall on the side of people actually being pretty good at solving certain kinds of decision-making problems under particular assumptions about the computational architectures that are available to them. So uh, I'm going to give you two examples of classic heuristics that come from the literature on human judgment and decision-making that are things that we can actually argue make a reasonable amount of sense if you think about them in the context of this kind of framework of uh, bounded optimality. So uh, the first example I'm going to talk about is uh, the availability of extreme events. And so this is a manifestation of a kind of bias that's called the availability bias. So basically, if you ask people to produce an estimate of how probable something is, uh, they'll produce that estimate based not necessarily on you know, what the actual probabilities of those things are, but rather how easy it is for them to generate examples of those things happening. So uh, one manifestation of this is that extreme events are things that come to mind easily, and as a consequence, people seem to overestimate their probability. So if you're thinking about going snorkeling, you should be thinking about something like this, but instead you're probably thinking about something like that, right? Um, and so, you know, people significantly overestimate the probabilities of shark attacks. They also overestimate the probabilities of terrorist attacks and other kinds of things that are plane crashes, things that are very relevant for the choices that we make in our lives and the way that we vote and other kinds of concerns, right? So the question that we can ask is, is this actually a sensible thing to do? So the assumption in the psychological literature has been that it's not, that basically this results in a kind of bias where you know, you're overestimating the probabilities of these events and that's just something which is bad, right? Bias is taken as being you know, a, a, a bad thing. Uh, but we can ask a question of you know, whether this is actually a, a reasonable thing to be doing once we actually consider the problem that people have to solve. So one way of formulating the problem that you're trying to solve when you're thinking about something like evaluating the expected utility of it, uh, when you're thinking about this, this problem is that, you know, if you're trying to decide whether you should go snorkeling or not, you have to solve the problem of evaluating the expected utility of an action. 
And so uh, what you need to do then is integrate over all of the possible outcomes that could occur with that probability multiplied by the utility of those outcomes, right? This is how we're gonna calculate our expected utility. The problem is that in any realistic situation, the space of possible outcomes that you have to consider is potentially very large, right? And so actually performing this integration is gonna be something that's quite costly. So a reasonable strategy that you might pursue if you were an engineer is, you know, instead approximate this calculation using, say, Monte Carlo, right? You're gonna generate some samples of possible outcomes. You're going to evaluate utilities for those outcomes. And you're gonna average those together. And so we'll make the assumption that the way that you're going to be solving this problem is by generating some relatively small number of samples from some distribution. And we'll assume that the cost of computation here, basically you can think about this as the opportunity cost, the time that you don't spend snorkeling because you're spending thinking about snorkeling, right, uh, is something which is going to increase linearly in the number of samples that you take. Okay? And so the idea then is we want to you know, try and keep the number of samples small, and we can ask what happens if we're trying to generate small numbers of samples to try and approximate these expected utilities. So if I say that I'm going to use Monte Carlo to approximate this integral, the, you know, the, the simplest algorithm that springs to mind is the one where we just generate these outcomes with their probability, right? So if we just choose the distribution that we're going to generate samples from to be the distribution P, which is actually the probabilities of those events occurring in the world, that seems like a reasonable thing to do. Uh, it's reasonable, it's intuitive, and it's unbiased. So if you actually follow that strategy, you're going to end up with estimates of this utility, which are unbiased estimates. And just like I said, you know, in the psychological literature, it's assumed that bias is bad, so this seems like the thing that you should be doing. But in fact, it's easy to argue that uh, unbiased sampling is actually a bad idea. So in particular, if you're in a situation where the utilities of those events vary significantly, and there are rare events which have extreme you know, large values of utility, uh, then doing unbiased sampling can be a bad idea. So, for example, if you were going to try and make a decision about whether you were going to play a game of Russian roulette, right, where there is a very bad outcome, which occurs with relatively low probability, and you did that by using uh, just, you know, Monte Carlo, simple Monte Carlo, to generate possible outcomes and then average those possible outcomes together to try and decide if this was a good thing to do or not, uh, you would have to generate 51 samples in order to have a 99.99% chance of realizing that this was a bad idea. Right? So you actually need to generate a relatively large number of samples in order to recognize that this is a bad thing to do. And the reason why is that uh, you know, in this kind of situation where you have a very skewed distribution of utilities, it's literally the variance that kills you. Right? So bias is one thing that you can care about in an estimator, but variance is another quantity. And bias and variance are things that trade off against one another. Using an unbiased estimator in this case results in an estimator that has a very high variance. And as a consequence, you, know, you can end up sort of missing the fact that this would be a, a, a bad thing to do if you're only generating a small sample. So what we need to think about then is a way that you can uh, appropriately trade off bias and variance in making these decisions. Uh, and one way to do that is by adopting a different strategy for doing your Monte Carlo approximation. So if you instead do a Monte Carlo approximation by importance sampling, so now uh, this is a method which we use for generating samples from complex distributions, like here P of X, you can tell that's a complex distribution. Uh, so this is something which is hard to sample from. So uh, what we do instead is choose a nice distribution that's easy to sample from, and we generate our samples from this nice distribution. And so we get a bunch of samples from that, but those are samples which come from the wrong distribution. So the way that we compensate for that is by reweighting those samples. So in regions where uh, P is greater than Q, we want to upweight our samples. In regions where Q is greater than P, we want to downweight our samples. And uh, then it turns out that the right way to calculate these weights is just to take the weight for each sample to be the ratio of P to Q. So we can choose whatever we want to choose for Q. We generate samples from Q. We then reweight based on this ratio of P to Q. Uh, and then we can calculate our expectation uh, by taking those weights and normalizing them. So our approximation to that probability distribution P is just the approximation that we get by taking this set of weighted atoms which are generated by our important sampling procedure. So Within this framework, we can ask a question about what we should choose for the distribution Q, right? Uh, part of our Monte Carlo algorithm here is the choice of the distribution that we're going to generate our samples from. And you can show that, uh, in fact, if you care about minimizing the variance of your estimator, then the optimal uh, distribution to sample from is one where we take Q 
proportional to p multiplied by the absolute value of the utility. Here it's the difference between the utility and the, uh, the actual expected utility, so the, the solution to this integral. So in general, you, know, you can't actually compute exactly this optimal distribution. But what it tells you is that uh, the distribution that you generate samples from should be one that pays attention to both of these variables that go into your decision, the probability of an outcome, but also the, the absolute value of the utility of that outcome. Uh, and so what that says is that you should be generating samples from a distribution which is biased in exactly the way that people are biased. You should generate samples from a distribution where those extreme events, like you know, shark attacks, are things that are significantly overweighted as a consequence of the fact that they end up with uh, high utilities, um, or high, in this case, uh, disutilities, uh, despite the fact that they have low probabilities. So. Uh, this is a good way of minimizing variance, and we've shown that if you take this strategy and um, sort of th these kind of skewed uh, decision-making situations, uh, variance is the thing that matters, and as a consequence, following something that's close to this optimal distribution. In fact, we look at what we call utility-weighted sampling, which is where um, we take the probability of an outcome and just multiply it by the absolute value of the utility of that outcome. Uh, ends up being uh, far better than doing simple Monte Carlo to solve that problem. So in this case, the bias that people seem to show, where we over-represent extreme events, is exactly the bias that you should show if you're making the best use of the limited resources that you have. If you're only able to generate a few possible outcomes, you should be generating those outcomes from a distribution that reflects the fact that uh, you know, both of these factors should matter. And we've done experiments where we'd sort of test out the predictions of this kind of account. Uh, so this is uh, from an experiment where we have people uh, look at a whole bunch of different things that could happen to you. Some of them are pretty mundane and some of them are pretty horrible. And for each of those things, we have people estimate how likely that thing is to happen as well as um, uh, to say how bad it would be. And so, you know, as you would expect, uh, normal things aren't that bad. You know, dying is pretty bad. Uh, but you also see this nice relationship where as the extremity of these things increases, so does the extent to which people overestimate its probability. And that's what's being shown here. So, you know, the probability of death is something which is massively overestimated relative to all, you know, for all possible causes of death. And we see a nice correlation between the extent to people which people tend to uh, overestimate the probability of an outcome um, and how extreme that, that thing is judged to be. Uh, it turns out that this strategy for evaluating expected utility results in a very simple uh, heuristic that you can follow. One that you know, looks a lot like the kinds of heuristics that people who have started with the sort of psychological data and then tried to figure out what people are doing have come up with. Here we derive this heuristic just from first principles saying what's the best way of making decisions from these small samples. So this heuristic is pretty straightforward. It says you generate from this utility-weighted distribution, and then you just tally the numbers of pros and cons. So if you're trying to decide between two options, A and B, those options differ in the probabilities that they assign to different outcomes. You generate from the utility-weighted distribution over outcomes that's associated with both of those uh, options. And then for each of those outcomes, you tally you know, for how many uh, that works out better for A versus it works out better for B. Uh, and so all that you're doing is generating from this biased distribution and then counting up the number of outcomes that favor one, uh, one decision over another. So this is something uh, which reproduces a bunch of phenomena in human decision making. Uh, these are sort of classic effects that previously have been explained again in terms of simple heuristics that are derived from behavioral data. Here we derive these from first principles. And it actually outperforms uh, cumulative prospect theory, which is a standard model of uh, how people make decisions when we look at it uh, in a large decision making data set. And so this is the kind of thing that you can think about using in the context of trying to reason from people's decisions back to their utilities that we expect that there's going to be this kind of manifestation of a bias in the way that people behave. But that it's something which is a consequence of pursuing a rational strategy at this more abstract level of choosing the algorithm that we use to solve the problem. The second example I'm going to talk about is um, another uh, phenomenon which comes from this literature on uh, heuristics and biases. Uh, in this case, it's about how people make judgments of quantities. So um, uh, this is a sort of audience participation moment. I want you to think about the answers to these questions. So think about what's the freezing point of vodka in degrees Fahrenheit? Uh, and uh, how long is Mars's orbit around the sun? Sometimes I ask people to say these out loud, but then people get really embarrassed, so I don't do that. Okay, okay. so uh, it turns out the freezing point of vodka is minus 17 degrees Fahrenheit. So most people overestimate that, yeah? 
Okay? And Mars's orbit around the sun is 687 days, which most people underestimate. Yeah? Okay, you can see how that tallies with your own subjective responses. Uh, the data say, this is what happens, uh, and the idea is that the reason why that happens is that you start with a more familiar example, what's called an anchor, so in this case the freezing point of water, or um, the duration of Earth's orbit around the sun, and then you fail to adjust away from it sufficiently. You know that you know, the Mars's orbit has to be more than Earth's orbit, and then as a consequence, you sort of adjust up, but you're like, well, maybe it's 435 days, I don't know, and then you don't go far enough, okay? So this phenomenon of anchoring and adjustment is one where people seem to make an iterative modification to a quantity, but they don't go far enough, or at least they don't get to the point where they end up being unbiased. And so again, we can ask a question of whether in this situation a bias is a reasonable thing to have. So here we can formulate this in terms of having a task where what we're trying to do is estimate a quantity based on some memory information that you have. You might have sort of had some experiences or have some vague memories or some knowledge about you know, the solar system. Uh, your, uh, and then we assume that you're, you're using an architecture. So again, you're doing a kind of Monte Carlo simulation, in this case, um, using the Metropolis-Hastings algorithm as an estimator. But in fact, the analysis goes through for um, a lot of iterative algorithms that have the same properties. And again, we assume that the cost increases linearly with the number of samples. So the idea is that when you're trying to make this judgment, what you're trading off is the quality of the answer that you produce versus the time that you spend thinking about it, right? And if you need to make a decision relatively quickly, we can see how that trades off with uh, the errors that you end up making and what the predictions are that this makes about the kinds of errors people should produce. So the Metropolis-Hastings algorithm is an iterative algorithm for producing samples from a probability distribution. So if you wanted to generate samples from this distribution P, uh, the way that you do this is you start out your Markov chain in some location, uh, and then you have a proposal distribution that produces a small variation around that. So you start out here, you make a proposal, and then you make a decision as to whether to accept that proposal based on the distribution you're trying to converge to. And so what happens is, over time, if you follow the, the sort of an acceptance rule which says you're more likely to accept those things that have higher probability under P, then over time what happens is your Markov chain converges to uh, a stationary distribution which corresponds to the distribution you want to sample from. So here, when we take these chains that are initialized at different points, after some amount of time, they all sort of come together and part of the space. And then if we average together, say, the last half of these samples, we get the histogram here, which approximates the distribution that we wanted to sample from. So uh, if we look at the properties of this algorithm, we say, OK, one of the things that statisticians have to do is to decide when to stop simulating, how long to run their Markov chain Monte Carlo simulation for. Maybe people are doing something similar. We can examine the kinds of biases that result from, uh, from doing that. And the basic result here is that bias is something which you know, makes a reasonable amount of sense. Basically, what you find is that, uh, so this is, the different lines here correspond to different initializations of our Markov chain Monte Carlo algorithm, different distances away from, uh, from the expected value of the distribution we're trying to converge to. But uh, across all of these, it's basically showing that the, the bias is something that decays here geometrically in the number of iterations of Markov chain Monte Carlo. So despite that geometric decrease, uh, if there's some linearly increasing cost for doing sampling, that means that there's going to be a point where it's not going to be worth you know, continuing to sample. You have diminishing returns in terms of how close you get to the solution. And so for all of these different uh, starting points, then as we, uh, as we vary the, the cost of doing each iteration of sampling relative to the errors that you make in the task, we're going to get out a different threshold in terms of uh, a different kind of bias that manifests uh, in uh, the judgments that you make. So the key result here is that the, 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 you should, you know, as a rational Markov chain Monte Carlo simulator, be biased, and the bias that you should have is going to be a bias which goes in the direction of the initialization of that Markov chain. And so what that means is that you're going to be biased in terms of, you know, in the direction of where you start out, and the exact nature of that bias is going to depend on the properties of the algorithm, and, uh, um, uh, and in particular, things like the amount of noise in the, in the estimate. And so we can take that kind of framework and we can actually look at empirical data on when people over and underestimate quantities. So this is what's called the adjustment score. This is how much people actually, uh, how, how much they, they tend to adjust and how accurate they are. So uh, 
the freezing point of vodka, you actually do a better job of adjusting towards the correct value than Mars's orbit around the sun. And this is something that we can actually predict using this kind of account, because um, uh, basically people have a higher level of uncertainty about um, Mars's orbit around the sun, and that's something which results in a, in a, a slower convergence of that Markov chain, and as a consequence, a, a larger uh, amount of error. Um, and this kind of framework actually predicts a, a bunch of other phenomena which come from this literature that uh, as you increase cognitive load, so you're doing something else, uh, time pressure, or if you give people alcohol, right, all things which change the number of iterations that they can effectively perform in the amount of time that you're providing them, then you get less adjustment and more error. Uh, the, the amount of bias that you get increases with the extremity of the anchor. If you start out at a point which is further away, then it, you know, you're going to show a larger bias. That being less certain in a quantity is something which increases the amount of anchoring that we see. And that giving people more knowledge is something which can reduce this bias or eliminate it. And these are all things that fall out of just thinking about this as a problem of statistical inference where we're using an iterative algorithm to solve that inference problem. So these are just two examples. Uh, but I think they illustrate the way that we can hopefully construct a framework which allows us to span between the, um, you know, the extreme of, on the one hand, uh, assuming people are completely rational, and on the other hand, assuming that people are completely irrational and just following a, a sort of, you know, a bunch of error-prone heuristics. That we can think about these heuristics as effective solutions, rational solutions, to the problem of solving problems of judgment and decision-making with limited computational resources. Uh, so I have a little bit of time left, um, and in that time I'm going to talk about just a few other examples of things that are going on in the lab that are uh, using this kind of framework or extending this framework in different directions. Um, so the first of these is uh, work on rational meta-reasoning. Again, this is being done by Falk Leder. Um, and this asks the question that, you know, if we think about uh, these decisions being made by our, you know, scientists who are deciding what computer algorithms to run and so on, then uh, what's going on in the head of the scientists, right? There's a kind of recursion that you get out of this, which is, okay, if we're following optimal strategies at this meta level, then how did we find those optimal meta level strategies and so on and so on and so on. And so we've thought about this in the context of um, uh, what's called rational meta reasoning. So rational meta reasoning is, you know, developing rational strategies that help you solve the problem of finding good meta level strategies, right? Um, and the... Uh, the, the framework that we use there is one which uh, says, think about actually building models of the error and time cost that's associated with running these different strategies. So you know, what you're doing at the meta level is solving a decision problem, where that decision problem is, do I execute this algorithm or this algorithm? And you can actually, it turns out, get away with building a very simple kind of model of what the profile of error and time costs are for those algorithms. So the idea is, uh, instead of actually working out what the value of computation would be in a particular situation, we approximate it. And the way that we approximate it is just using a simple regression model. So you say, OK, I'm going to decide which algorithm to execute. I'm just going to build a simple model that tells me how likely it is that this is going to work and how long I think it's going to take. And that gives me the information that I need in order to actually make this decision. Uh, and this is very different from standard approaches that have been taken in psychology, which are more focused on sort of thinking about this as a model-free reinforcement learning problem, where basically you just say, okay, try this strategy, that didn't work. Try this strategy, that worked. Okay, I'll try that one again. This is a, a more kind of deliberative, but nonetheless relatively simple kind of approach. So what's interesting about this from the perspective of thinking about this you know, potential recursion where we have turtles all the way down is that it suggests that you don't need to do that. You can actually get away with using a very simple meta-level strategy and nonetheless get good gains in terms of how well that helps you, you know, solve the, uh, the original decision problem. And so we've done a bunch of experiments which test this out. I'll show you one fun experiment. Uh, this is fun for computer scientists. Uh, so we actually taught a bunch of people on Mechanical Turk different sorting algorithms, which we had them manually execute. So uh, <laughs> one of these algorithms is um, a cocktail sort. So it's basically like a, a bidirectional bubble sort. So you go through one way, and then you go back the other way. And the other was merge sort. Um, and the reason why we did this was because we were basically it gave us a way of externalizing people's knowledge about algorithms. Um, so we could teach them these algorithms, and then we could give them problems. And we could say, OK, now you're going to solve this problem. Which algorithm should you execute to do this? And so it gave us a way of sort of taking those strategies which they might have inside their heads and putting them outside their heads so we could actually measure what they were doing. So the reason why we use these two uh, algorithms is that 
uh, bubble sort, as much as it's maligned, is actually a pretty good algorithm if the list that you get is already pretty well sorted, whereas merge sort is going to just mess that up, right? So um, uh, what that means is that you can actually learn that there are circumstances where you should be using bubble sort, even though it's something which performs worse with longer lists. So we gave people a bunch of those decision problems, uh, and this is looking at... Um, uh, so over here, you can actually see the yellow bar is human choice of the optimal algorithm for solving this problem. And it turns out people are pretty good at actually sort of figuring out what algorithm you should use to solve a problem. In fact, they outperform all of the adaptive sorting algorithms that we, we looked at. Um, so about 80% of the time, they could make the correct choice as to whether to use a bubble sort or a merge sort to solve this problem. And then using a meta-reasoning approach where um, we just uh, built a simple linear model of the execution time of these different algorithms using features that corresponded to uh, the pre-sortedness of the list, and then uh, the length of the list, and the, the square of the length of the list. We can actually build a model which says uh, very, you know, about 70% of the time, and correlates very well with human judgments, uh, which algorithm it should be executing. So a very simple meta-reasoner can actually make a lot of progress in making appropriate choices of the algorithms. And then these are all different kinds of reinforcement learning algorithms that did poorly on this task. So we've done the same kind of thing with internal strategies, and, and this kind of approach actually seems like a good way of capturing the decisions that people make about what strategies to execute. A setting which might be more uh, relevant to thinking about um, robotics is looking at uh, the same kind of approach in the context of meta-reasoning for uh, physical simulation. So, you know, uh, when you're planning uh, trajectories, one of the things you can do is simulate those trajectories. And we have a line of work, this is with Jess Hamrick, uh, which looks at um, the question of uh, whether people run those same kind of internal simulations when they're trying to answer questions about intuitive physics. So, for example, if this dot is moving along this trajectory, in our experiment we actually, you know, show you the dot moving along the trajectory, is it going to go through this hole before it hits the wall? Yes or no? Yes? Okay. What about this one? Okay. So it takes people, you know, a little bit longer to answer that question, and that's basically what we find. So uh, the prediction that you make if you think about this as a statistical reasoning problem is that uh, the if you think about it as a, a sort of sampling process where you're making a decision about how much time you're going to spend sampling on the basis of the, you know, trying to answer these kinds of questions, then cases where you have more uncertainty in the outcome are going to be cases where you need to sample more often, right? Where you're sampling from a distribution that has higher variance. And that's exactly what we find. So this is looking at how long it takes people to answer these questions versus the proportion of the time that they say that it's going to go through the hole. And so this uh, line here corresponds to the prediction that results from a classic model of um, this used in statistics called sequential probability ratio testing, which is basically like if you're running statistical significance tests but peeking, as you're, peeking at your data as they come in and you're trying to decide when you should stop collecting data. Uh, and this approach actually gives us predictions which give us a very good match to the judgments that people make in these tasks. So in this case, we can make predictions about how long it's going to take somebody to solve a physical reasoning problem based on thinking about them as trying to utilize this internal simulator and, you know, trying to make the best use of the samples that that simulator is producing. Um, we uh, have a project with uh, Smith and Millie and uh, Falk Leader, which um, uh, asks a question which is very pertinent to one of the books that I was showing, which is how many cognitive systems? So if you've read Daniel Kahneman's book, which I think at this point everybody in the world has done, uh, then uh, it talks about exactly this idea that there are two systems, a fast system and a slow system. Uh, and so you know, one question that you can ask from the perspective of this sort of meta-reasoning approach is, why would that make sense, right? Under what circumstances should you have a fast system and a slow system or two systems at all? If you think about you know, decision-making from the perspective of meta-reasoning, what you should be doing is just adaptively modulating the amount of effort that you're putting into solving problems based on these trade-offs between time and error. Uh, but uh, what we can actually show is that if you actually think about it in terms of there being some cost which is associated with engaging in meta-reasoning, uh, then that's something which tells you that, in fact, you know, you should modulate the number of systems. So this is just showing, as we look at the expected utility per time for people solving, in this case, a very simple problem, which is a problem where you have to decide which of two levers to pull, and you can simulate the outcome of pulling the levers, or you can pull the levers. And so each simulation costs you a chance to pull levers, but gives you information about the probability that, you know, one of them is going to pay off. So if you allow for there being some amount of cost for... Um, 
having more systems that you're going to use to solve a problem, then that's something which is going to prefer you know, having fewer systems. But critically, the thing that really determines what the optimal number of systems is going to be is the relationship between the costliness of meta-reasoning and the variability of the environment, which here corresponds to uh, what we look at is the variability of this ratio that I've been talking about, of the ratio of uh, time cost to uh, uh, to essentially error cost, right? So if you're um, in a world where the ratio of time cost to error cost is constant, so you know a world where you only ever need to solve problems at the same speed, right, then you know one system is sufficient, that's all you need. But as the variability of the time cost to error cost ratio increases, so as you begin to face problems where you know in some problems you have to solve in a few milliseconds and some problems you have to solve in a few minutes, then it makes sense to have multiple systems. In this case, what those systems correspond to is basically making, uh, like flipping, say, one coin, you know, taking one sample before taking an action versus taking, say, seven samples before taking an action. So if you look at the profile of, say, these regimes where two systems are preferred, uh, the profile is one where you have one fast system which is going to act in situations where you need to be moving quickly and you know where it matters more to act than to get information, and one system which focuses on getting lots of information before taking an action in exactly the same way that uh, we see in the psychological literature. So what's interesting about this is that I think if you, if you think about the context of human decision-making, it's very clear that there is a huge amount of variability in the ratio of these costs where you, know, you have to make a split-second decision to pull a toddler out from in front of a car, or you spend days trying to figure out whether you should start a war, right? there are you know, a, a wide range of, uh, sort of variations in both the time scale and the, the, the sort of moral magnitude of the decisions that we end up making. And so I think you can make an argument that it's that variation that's the thing that would then lead us to have you know, multiple strategies for solving these problems. The last thing that I'm just going to mention rather than talking about in detail uh, is work that we've been doing on optimal gamification. So uh, this is uh, by Falk Leader and, and Paul Kruger. So the idea here is that if you think about humans as boundedly rational or boundedly optimal agents, one place where boundedness matters is in our ability to see into the future. right? And there are a lot of problems where when we're trying to make decisions, making those decisions requires planning on a horizon that goes beyond the immediate horizon that we have. And so what we've been looking at in, in this work is sort of taking that idea that people might be limited in, in how far we can sort of look in, in solving problems and trying to think about how you should design systems which are going to make it easier for people to do a good job of solving problems that would potentially require them to plan on a horizon that goes beyond the planning horizon that they have. And so, you know, one way that this is done empirically is through uh, gamification. So this is an example of uh, a gamification system where I think it's called Habitica, uh, and you can assign yourself points for, you know, doing tasks like finishing your taxes or calling your mom, and then you level up your avatar and so on. And so one way that you can think about what gamification is doing is uh, it's taking something where, you know, there's potentially a, a long-term reward and it's moving that long-term reward into a shorter-term future, right? So you know, uh, you're, you're making it so that you're, you're actually getting a sort of extra payoff for doing that thing now that you know, is going to potentially have a payoff down the line, right? Um, so we have a project where we've been trying to think about you know, how to actually formalize this process of gamification uh, by thinking about sequential decision problems that we can formulate in terms of Markov decision processes. Uh, and the key insight is that you know, there is a formal literature on how to optimally gamify things, but it's a formal literature which has been thought about in the context of uh, building computer-based reinforcement learning agents. So uh, if you look at uh, the, you know, the place to look for this is the, the shaping theorem, which says that there's a way of modifying the reward function of a Markov decision process such that the optimal policy remains invariant. Um, and so as long as you have a, a reward function which has this property, which is basically that it's a potential function defined on the states, then that's a reward function which is not going to modify the optimal policy. Uh, and if you have, so that defines a class of reward functions that you can look at that you can sort of, you know, you, you can add on to your existing reward function. Uh, we call them pseudo rewards. Uh, and then if you have a, 
uh, a completely myopic agent, you can say, well, what's the very best choice that I could make for those pseudo rewards? And that very best choice turns out to be the potential function that corresponds to the value function of that markup decision process. And so what we've been doing is basically taking problems that people need to solve, formulating them in markup, terms of markup decision processes, and then offloading the computation from our bounded human brains to a computer which solves the Markov decision process, gives you back a value function for every state, and then using the value function to construct a profile of pseudo rewards, which we then deliver to the human beings in order to help them fulfill their goals. So um, we've done experiments on this at the moment using a mostly artificial domain. I'm not going to talk about it in detail, but basically you have to sort of figure out the best way to get this plane to fly around. Uh, and what we find is that um, using this scheme for constructing optimal pseudo rewards is actually you know, the only thing that we've, we've found that actually improves people's performance on this task. So it's a task where they have to plan over horizon, which is, in this case, four steps. It's hard for people to do that, but by using the pseudo rewards, what we do is reduce the planning horizon to the point where they can act you know, just using a, a one-step look-ahead procedure uh, and nonetheless end up following the optimal strategy. Okay. So, uh, and then we've also started to use this as an approach for thinking about connections between model-based and model-free reinforcement learning, uh, but I'm not going to have time to talk about that. So, the key idea here is that uh, resource rationality gives us a way of bridging these two different perspectives on the human mind, uh, a way of making a framework that's realistic in terms of giving predictions about human behavior that actually line up with human behavior, but systematic as a way of generating models that give us you know, predictions and can provide the basis for performing inferences about the things that inform uh, people's behavior. Uh, one insight that comes out of doing this is that when we actually look at the kinds of heuristics that people seem to use, they're not just sort of hacks or kludges that sort of let us get around and not, you know, uh, most of the time do things okay, but they turn out to be pretty reasonable sorts of strategies uh, if we think about people solving a problem of having, you know, very constrained computational resources. Well, one way that I think about this is to say that, you know, bias isn't necessarily evidence that we're irrational, it's just evidence that we're solving a difficult problem with limited resources. Um, and this approach gives us a way that we can actually tackle questions about how people use those resources uh, and potentially a framework that you could use to design systems to overcome those limitations. Thank you. Okay, he's got a tight deadline at 5 o'clock. His kid's waiting to be picked up, so we have time for seven minutes of questions. Yeah. So the state of between the accuracy of the decisions and so the number of samples you pick or the number of amount of time is somewhat reminiscent also of explore exploit yeah. and online learning and so on. Yeah. Are there informal connections? Uh, yes. <laughs> I mean, it's 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 very much the same kind of problem. Um, uh, so it's yeah, it's related to like I said, like. Um, you can look at things like sequential probability ratio testing, which is a very basic kind of, you know, constrained form of that kind of explore-exploit problem. It's basically how much do you sample before you take action. Uh, so it's the kind of thing that people use as a primitive sort of algorithm in A-B testing and things like that, um, and as an alternative to bandit formulations. Yeah. Yeah. In the same vein, is there like a... Do these models also work for animals? Or yeah, so we would, we would, yeah, that's a good question. Um, so I think, I think there are two parts of that. So uh, for something where it's really just a consequence of the architecture, right, that's what you would expect. But I think one of the things that makes human beings smart is that we're able to make good use of our architecture, right? So if you think about that meta-meta reasoning problem, right, the problem of finding effective strategies for solving problems, uh, or that's just the meta-reasoning problem. Yeah, finding, finding effective strategies for solving problems. I think people are really good at that, and that's something you know, which we don't normally think about as an aspect of human intelligence, but that I actually think, you know, if you'd asked me like 10 years ago, or like, I guess the, like, there was a big chunk of my career which was based on sort of arguing that what makes people smart is having good inductive biases, which is basically, you know, allows us to constrain the hypotheses that we consider when we're solving problems, and then that allows us to learn better than computers, right? Um, but I think this is the other component of what makes us smart, is that we're able to make really good use of the cognitive resources that we have. And we're able to develop effective strategies for solving those problems. You can kind of think about it as, you know, we're good cognitive programmers, right? We're good at coming up with algorithms that allow us to, to do a decent job of solving problems. And so that problem, we call that the problem of strategy discovery. That's a problem we're actively working on. I think it's very relevant to thinking about questions in AI. Um, it's a really hard problem, but it's a really cool problem.
Yeah. So I know it's where it's um so another thing that makes us smart, I think, is 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 uh is the idea that we we often work in groups. And and so if I if I if I read you correctly, most of what your work has been on individual right. behavior. Although you talk about this idea of um, many cognitive systems, but they're within the individual. Right. I'm curious have you how does this relate to the idea of a group psychology, a group yeah. interaction? Um, so there are a couple of things that relate to that. So, so one is I have a whole line of work which is on cultural evolution, which is basically looking at if we take these same kinds of cognitive mechanisms, in particular thinking about human inference from the perspective of something like Bayesian inference, what predictions does that make about the consequences of cultural transmission of information and the circumstances under which people can accumulate information and so on. And we actually have an experimental framework for running large-scale computer simulations of uh, evolutionary processes with human beings. So uh, using crowdsourcing. So if anybody's interested in that, you can talk to me. So that, that's a whole other talk. So, um, uh, so I think there are a couple of interesting ways that this relates. Uh, but the most interesting is one which it doesn't, which is that um, I think when we human beings reason about the things that other human beings do, we don't take boundedness into account as much as we should. So we tend to assume, so I talked about all of these heuristics and biases and so on. Part of the reason why those heuristics and biases are so interesting to us, you know, when we read these psychology papers and, or we read, you know, Dan O'Connor's book, uh, is that our intuitive theory of how human minds work is much closer to expected utility theory. So if I'm trying to make sense of the actions that you're taking, I'm assuming that you're pursuing actions which are actually reflective of your underlying preferences, right? Uh, whereas, in fact, it could just be that you know you overloaded your cognitive resources and are you know not acting in a way which is in your best interest. Um, and so, I think there's something which is deep and interesting about that, which is that it kind of says that you know expected utility theory is wrong as a theory of human behavior, but it's right as a theory of you know the theory of human behavior that we're using. Um, uh, and you know, and and then you can ask questions about why that might be, and, and how that relates to the cognitive limitations that we have, because I think it actually turns the problem into one that's easier. Something that Smith has and I talked about. Yeah. It just seems that it raises the potential that the reward chasing idea. Right. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. There is a. I mean, Daniel's been working on. Um, uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a game theoretic analog of this. So the same theorem applies to stochastic games. And so we've been thinking about using this as a way of shaping people to better equilibria for games. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no. <laughs> yeah, that's an open question. Yeah. <laughs> Uh -huh, yeah, right. Yeah. No, I mean, my, right. No, there are lots of people who want to answer that kind of question. But, um, I mean, the way that you answer it is empirically, which is building models that make different assumptions about what's innate and then seeing how well those line up with human behavior based on the kind of data that people get. And so as we're coming up with better learning strategies and we're coming up with new ways of formulating problems, the horizon on that changes all the time. 